you have your Bible, you want to turn to Psalm 23, continuing our series, Summer in the Psalms. <clears throat> For those of you that are, are visiting our church, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Jimmy Smith, and I'm on staff. Our senior pastor is on that trip to Africa on his way, on his way back, and he'll be back here in the, in the pulpit here next week, and uh, I've had the privilege to be here with you guys the last couple of weeks, and so um, I'm just always thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, now, I, I did some research online on, on some of the most famous or most popular or most familiar Bible verses, and, and anybody have any idea what, what usually ranked as number one as the most famous or most familiar? Any, any, any guess? John 3.16, you're exactly right. John 3.16 was the number one on most of the lists that I saw. Philippians 4.13 was on there. Usually I can do all things through Christ. Uh, Jeremiah 20.11 was another familiar, for I know the plans I have for you. 1 Corinthians 13, um, th those first uh, seven or eight verses, that, the love chapter, that was there. And somewhere always in maybe the top five or, or definitely the top ten on every list was Psalm 23. Uh, and, and even if you've never ever read the Bible before, you've probably heard bits and pieces of, of Psalm 23 are part of it. And Psalm 23 is a great psalm of comfort. Now, David wrote this psalm, and, and there was no really real particular event to tied to this psalm. Now, a lot of the psalms that David wrote, uh, there's always a little, little description about because this had to do with, he wrote this when he was thinking about this or went through this. But for this one, it just says it's, it's a psalm of David. And, and he was probably uh, already king when he wrote this. And, and some scholars think that maybe he was kind of advanced in age, getting towards the uh, end of his life and sort of looking back. Uh, he was looking back on God's faithfulness, God's comfort, God's security, God's presence. But it wasn't for David. It wasn't just to look back, but it, it was also his present reality because David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, and, and so it's not was. And so it, it was still true for him as he's writing this psalm. And Psalm 23, is, it's probably familiar to, to uh, many of you. How many of you have, it's just a show of hands, and if you don't, don't worry about it. This isn't meant to call you out. But how many of you have some portion of Psalm 23 memorized? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. You know, yeah, you, you, some of you have a piece of it. Some of you may have all of it. And so it's very, it's very familiar. But one of the things, as you know, that one of the negatives of something becoming super familiar is that can, it can lose its fire in our lives. Familiarity can lead to maybe even a loss of an impact in our lives. Instead of being words of power, uh, they just become words, um, just like any other words. We, we just become numb to these things. So um, we, we, we miss things or we don't notice things anymore in the passage or any other scripture that's familiar. And so I, I think it's important that we, we start to look at scripture, especially if we're familiar with scripture. Now, I'm always kind of jealous. I remember walking through uh, some scripture with, with this guy who'd never read it before. We, we would meet, Ross and I would meet uh, him at, at, at uh, Torchy's Tacos, and we met with him for several weeks and he'd never read this stuff before. So it was just like all the questions that he would have and, and just, he, you know, just crazy stuff that he would ask because he's never heard it before. And I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm kind of jealous of those people because they're just reading and it's all fresh. And for us, sometimes if we're familiar with it, it can just kind of just become words. And so we have to look at it uh, with a different perspective. It's almost like, um, you know, my, my wife and I, we, we, we watch different TV shows. Uh, we've been married uh, and there's been certain shows that we would watch and we would kind of get into. Through, we don't watch a lot of TV, but we do watch some. I watch more than she does. I, I watch a lot of educational things like the NFL and the Golf Network. Those are the Golf Channel. Those are, those are, those are kind of my go-tos. But here's the thing. Watching TV before you had kids was, was, was an experience, but then watching TV when you had kids was a completely different, different experience. And it's interesting as a parent to watch a show that you've always watched and a show that you've probably seen a thousand times, but then you watch it with, with your child sitting next to you and they're watching the show too. And here's the thing, all of the sudden, all of the sudden, that show that was really funny and really harmless and you were just like, bah, ha, ha. And then now there's a little child watching you and hearing the same thing. All of a sudden, you're like, whoa, I didn't know they said that. I didn't know that was in there. Wait, wait, when did this show become rated R all of a sudden? What's going on here? And, and it's not that the show changed, but what changed? Your perspective. 
You were seeing things differently now. You were hearing things that basically you'd kind of become, you become numb to. Or we just, we just, it just kind of lost its effect on you. And, 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 I, and what I want to do today, this morning with Psalm 23, is I just want to, I want us to look at it for the first time or for the first time again uh, and, and see it with a fresh pair of eyes and ask God to really create a freshness in our hearts for this passage. In Psalm 23, it's a great passage of God's comfort, but it's also more than that. It's a, a passage that speaks about humility, it speaks about surrender, it speaks about power, and it speaks about purpose. So let's, let's read that, and, and I'm going to read uh, Psalm 23, and I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, and it says it this way. And I apologize if, it doesn't, if it's not the King James the way that you, you memorize it, and, and that's fine too. This is just a different translation, a little bit more modern, but the message is exactly the same. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. One of the interesting things you could do when you read this later on, or maybe now, go back and underline the things that God is doing for you. Or maybe even circle the things that you need him to do. You need him to lead you. You need him to renew you. Um, so back to verse 3. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. For you, God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Now, some interesting notes about this passage, and, and one is that David, though he is king of Israel, if you know anything about David, and, and some of you do, some of you don't, um, he, is, he knows the job of a shepherd, because when David was a boy, he was a shepherd. He knows what it means to care for, he knows what it means to protect sheep, to lead them, to guide them. He knows the, the frustrations that come with that job. He knows the hard work that comes with that job. And he also knows the connection that the shepherd has with the sheep. So he's got, he, he has real intimate knowledge of being a shepherd. And so when he says that the Lord is my shepherd, that, means, that really means something to him because he, he's lived that life. But something else that, that's interesting about that term, shepherd, is and that David refers him to that. If you know anything about shepherd in, in, in biblical times, shepherds, that wasn't a real high-profile job. That wasn't a—it it probably, you know, maybe it would be a, a minimum wage or, or way even less job. And so it's not really a phrase that you— if you want to impress someone, say, this guy's a shepherd, back in, in this time, people are going to go— neat. Yes. So what? He's a she The shepherd was, it, it was a job that was reserved for, for, for young people or people who didn't have status or people who maybe who didn't have any other skills. Um, it was, it, it, it didn't really, the job didn't have come with any influence or, or any authority over anybody. It was a lonely job. And, and so there's almost, and, and there's so many other things that, that, that God is referred to in the Psalms. If you think about it, if you ever read it, you know, he's referred to as shield, or he's referred to as my rock, or as my fortress, uh, my, my hiding place, a place of safety, my place of refuge, uh, a, a thing of joy. But David here in this psalm, he doesn't use any of those, those normal terms that you would, you would think of. And, but I love this quote that, that I found about why David called God shepherd. It said this, David had himself been a keeper of sheep and understood both the needs of the sheep and the many cares of a shepherd. He compares himself, this is David, he compares himself to a creature weak, defenseless, and foolish, and he takes God to be his provider, preserver, director, and indeed his everything. The shepherd was everything for the sheep. So for David to say, the Lord is my shepherd, it spoke to this intimacy that he felt for God and the overwhelming love and care that he felt from God. But let's, let's, I want to just kind of quickly go verse by verse and just draw out application for us. And, and so in verse 1, David says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. And so if you're taking notes, this is going to be the first thing in your outline. David saying this and us saying this, well, this is an acknowledgment of my need for God and my intention to not chase after more 
than what God desires for me. It's, it's an acknowledgement of my need for God and my intention to not chase after more than what God desires for me. You see, Psalm 23 is not a psalm about self-sufficiency. It's not about self-sufficiency. It's quite the opposite. And saying that the Lord, if you were to say that the Lord is my shepherd, it's you admitting two things. One, that you are a sheep. And two, that you need a shepherd. And admitting that you're a sheep means that you're saying, I'm prone, I'm prone to wander, to just, to just go off and do. I'm prone, to, I'm prone to follow whatever is popular. If you know sheep, they're, they're a herd mentality. Uh, and wherever, uh, wherever one goes, they, they tend to all go. Um, I, I need guidance. Sheep don't know. They need direction. I'm vulnerable. I'm selfish. In other words, all I'm thinking about is me, and so I'm just going to do me. And I'm weak. Now, how many of you would stand up right now and say, yep, that's me. I'm prone to wander. I follow whatever's popular. I need guidance. I need direction. I'm vulnerable. I'm selfish. I'm weak. Stand with me. You know, none of you would do that. No, we wouldn't do that. Why? Because we're prideful people. We don't want to admit that. We're, we're, we're strong people. To say you're weak, well, that's, that's weak. Um, it, it, it's weak to say that you need direction. It's weak to say that you're vulnerable. It's weak to say that you're a sheep. No, no. In our world we, we, that we live in today, we're taught to say that we're lions. We're not sheep. We're lions. We're fierce. We're strong. We're powerful. We can do anything, right? That's, that's, that's what we're supposed to be. But the truth is, and this is truth regardless if you believe it or not, we're all sheep. I'm sheep. And it takes great humility to admit that. And it's important, it's an important truth that we all need to acknowledge. Matthew 5, 3 says this, humble men are very fortunate, he told them. This is Jesus talking. For the kingdom of heaven is given to them. Not to the prideful people, not to the, to the strong, not to the people that are beating their chest saying, here I am, listen to me roar. No, it says humble men are very fortunate. For the kingdom of heaven is given to them. And here's the deal. You ready for this? You won't run to the Savior if you don't think you need saving. You won't go to the shepherd if you don't think you need a shepherd. Humility says, I, and pardon my English here, I don't got this. I don't got this. I can't do this on my own. I need something more than myself. I know I'm limited. I know I'm prone to selfishness. I know I'm prone to make dumb decisions. I know I, I, I'm prone to overreact. I know I care way too much about what people think of me. I need help. I need hope. I need God. I need a shepherd. And that's where God is so ready to step in and give you the direction you, the direction you need, the love that you need, and the purpose that we all need. But more than just admitting that we need that, saying that the Lord is my shepherd is saying and that I'm not going to go after anything else because nothing else is going to satisfy. Why go to creation when you personally have all access to the creator? Why go, why go, why go you know, to the, to the low man on the totem pole when you've got complete and total access to the owner, to the CEO, to the boss, to the creator, to the inventor. And say, so if you say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It means I've got everything I need, but also I'm not going to go after anything else. The Lord is my shepherd. He's enough. He's more than enough. I have all that I need. And then in verse 2, he says, he lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And a lot of attention gets, is, is given to the, to the pastures and to the waters, to the green pastures. So you know it's, it's lush and it's going to provide what they need. And, and to the still waters, it's quiet, it's calm, there's peace. And, and rightly so, we should focus on that. But, but today, I, one of the beautiful things, the, I said that funny, one of the beautiful things in this verse is for me is I think, I don't have to know where the pastures and waters are. I just need to follow Jesus. I don't need to know where the pastures are and the water is. I just need to follow Jesus. Verse 2, and, and some of your Bibles says, he, it may say it this way, he makes me, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And the idea is, is that I don't know where to stop. I, I, I don't know where, where we're going. The, the shepherd is the one who says, here, right here. This is, this is good. Right here, this is where you need to be. Right here, you'll find exactly what you need. Right here, you will experience refreshment. 
renewal. Right here, you will be fulfilled. Right here is where you will be satisfied. Follow me, and I'll lead you where you need to go. Follow me, and I'll lead. Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, The Lord himself, and I love these two, I love this phrase. The Lord himself goes before you, so he's ahead of you, and he goes, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We, you know, we want to know the ending, right? We want to know how this is going to go. We want to know the final results. I'm guilty of this. I think we all are. We want to know before we go, right? And there's a lot. There's, there's some good wisdom in that unless it keeps you from following God in faith. Then it's not wisdom, but it's, it's just simply sin. And faith, faith is going when God says go, even when you don't know where to go. Did you catch that? Faith is going when God says go, even when you don't know where to go. But I get it, though. Um, God, if you would just show me how this movie ends in my life, then, then I'll be okay. Or just let me, let me peek. Let, let me look behind the curtain, God. Let me see a little bit of where we're headed or where you're taking me or what you're asking me to do. Let me see how it's going to end up. Then I'll be all right. Then I'll be glad to go. But that's not faith. Faith, as the Bible defines it, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to be afraid. Some people might ask you these questions when you're following God because it's kind of foreign to them and they don't get it. Where, where are you going? Now, where are you going again? What, 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 what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That doesn't make sense. That seems really kind of, that, that seems kind of, you know, out of uh, your comfort zone. That's not, in, in, I don't see anyone else doing that. And actually, those are probably things that, that we're saying to ourselves and, and saying to God. And here's how God would respond to that. God would tell us, you don't have to know the what. You don't have to know the where. You don't have to know the why. You don't even know have to know the how. Because you know the who. You know who. All you have to do is follow God. He says, I will lead you. I will lead you to the green pastures. I will lead you to the quiet waters. And David goes on in verse 3, and he says, He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. And, and, and I think about this, and, and the truth for me is, I am made new by Christ so that I can live my life for Christ. And the key, the key verse there, or the key part in verse 3 is for his name's sake. It's, it's for him. Um, Colossians 1.16 says, because, of all things were, because all things were created by him, both in the heavens and on the earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and say those last two words with me, for him. Through him and for him. And those two words, I, we tend as a, as a culture to get those, those, mis, those messed up. And we, we, we replace for him with for me. For me. And, and, and speaking of getting things mixed up, as I was thinking about this, this story popped into my head. Um, my father-in-law, was a, he, he grew up being a farmer, a uh, rancher his whole life. He, he worked, he, you know, he worked hard, harder than any one of any man I know, and, and one, of the, one of the times where he was working, he actually asked me uh, to go out with him. And so I, I immediately got excited, but then I immediately got afraid because I, I was like, what, what am I going to do? What, what is city boy Jimmy going to do with, with, with Grant, my father? I never, called him, I never called him by his name. That's really kind of funny. It was always sir, okay? And then when we had kids, it was granddad. And so I think his name is Grant. No, I'm just kidding. I know his name. But I never called him. I never. So anyway, he asked me that. He said, would you go with me? And I was like, sure. But then I was like, I don't know what, what to do. And then there was a little bit of fear in me, uh, as me being his son-in-law, there was a little bit of fear that he would take me out into the country and then just leave me there. So there was that part of it. There was a little bit of that. But I, I found out what my job was going to be was we were going to go check cattle. And so we, there's different sections of land you got to go to all over. And so what, what we would check it, um, we were checking it in, in his, his, uh, his pickup. And so we would... My job was, as we'd get to a gate, I would pop out of the pickup, open the gate, he would drive through, hopefully wait for me, and then I would, I would 
close the gate and, and, and secure it because, and this wasn't just like the, the gates you have in your fence. I mean, these things, you kind of had to lean into them and push them and pull the bar bar. And it was, it was, some of you know what this is, some of you don't, and that's okay. I didn't know either until I did it. And then get back in, 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 in the pickup, and then we go look at, we go check the rest of the cows. So th- we, we did this, and, and before we did that, you know, I was, I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing. And so I, I gave Shonda a, a really long hug goodbye because I didn't know if I'd ever see her again. And so, um, we went out, and, and things were going great. We, we, we were, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of chit-chat. Uh, he, was, he was a man of a few words, but, but we were going, and so we'd get to a gate. I'd jump out and, and open it. He'd pull through, and, cause, and this was helping him because, you know, if, if, he'd, if I wasn't there, he'd have to do it himself. Oh, and one of the things that Shonda reminded, that made me a little bit more nervous, she said, whatever you do, run. Just do it fast. Because he, 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 he doesn't like to waste time, you know, he, he just wants to get it done. So that was on my mind too. So I, I would jump out and I'd run as fast, well, I'd walk as fast as I could and I'd get there, do that. And, and so everything was going great until I made a city boy moronic mistake. So now I'm going to, I wish I had something to show you. But so, so I get out, okay, I'm just going to do it this way. So I open the gate, okay, I, I, I unloose it and I pull it this way. He goes through, okay. Now, remember, a gate's here. Truck's on that side now. And then I do this. I do like this, and I strain, get it, get it, goo, and I got it. Now let's go to the truck. Gate. <laughs> and I'm like, poop. <laughs> so then I've got to get the gate open, struggle to do that, open it, let me in, and then do it back. And so in my mind, I'm just like, oh, God, please, he didn't see that. He didn't see it. It's a small window in the, in the back of his feed feed pickup. He didn't see it. It's okay. I run around there. You know, it took me a little bit longer. Got, got in there, and we drove off. He didn't say anything. He didn't say anything the whole time. And I was like, yes. He didn't see it. He didn't see it. He was probably just distracted looking at, looking out at, at, at what was going on or, or, or thinking of where he was going to drop me off and leave me. He was thinking about other things. And so, and, 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 and I was mortified because that was a stupid thing to do, you know, and I didn't want him to see it. And, and plus, it was costing us valuable time. But anyway, he never said a word about it and didn't say anything to me, and I didn't say anything about it. And so I thought I was in the clear because I thought he missed it. Uh, but uh, much to my embarrassment, he found out. He told my mother-in-law. He told Shonda about it. And so they had a good chuckle. I don't know if he laughed about it, but anyway, um, my wife had a good chuckle with it. Um, and, and, you know, what, what, what I learned that day was that, that I, I can be, I, can be a, I don't need to be a moron. Okay, that was one of the things I learned. But another thing is, like, I, I was in such a hurry that I just wasn't even thinking about what I was doing. And I got everything, I did everything right, but I got it, I just did it backwards. And you know what, I, I think sometimes what this verse is telling us and reminding us is saying, listen, we can get so busy doing our thing, thinking about what we want to do and how we want to do it and when we want to do it, and we just get so busy thinking about us that we don't even realize that we're trapping ourselves in a life of sin. We're trapping ourselves in a life of unfulfillment. We're trapping ourselves in a life of, of unsatisfaction. And, and, and God sits there, probably much like my father-in-law did. I'm sure he's just looking at the back of his window and shaking his head and just saying, what, what a goof. But God sits there and and, and, and he just says, you don't even realize that you're doing it. You don't realize that you're headed down a wrong way. You don't see what your decisions, what's happening. You're in such a rush to do your own thing that you're missing what I want. And David, David said he wanted us to know and he remembered that, listen, we were made new so that we could accomplish what God wants to do for our lives for his name's sake, not for my name's sake, not for what I want to do, not for my glory but for God's glory. And so we have to remember that to say that we were created by God for God, not by God for ourselves. In verse 4, David goes on. He says, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And here's the truth there. Dark valleys are a part of life. You've heard that over and over in this series. But God is my comfort. He's my protection and my light in those dark valleys. Your Bible may say it this way, the valley of the shadow of death. And the bottom line is this, that God knows the valley. He knows what it is. He knows the need that's in that valley. He knows the way out. God knows what he's trying to do in your life. And here's the other thing, God knows you. He knows you. 
And so he, he knows the valley. He knows what we're up against. He, it's no surprise to him. He, he knows what you need. He's not panicked because he's God, and he knows he can give you exactly what you need. A lot of people say that God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. Because if you, if, you, if you never got anything more than you could handle, then you wouldn't need God because you could handle it. No, you're going to be allowed to go into a lot of situations that's overwhelming to you. But God says, don't be overwhelmed because I'm God and I'm not overwhelmed. I know exactly what you need. I'm not panicked. He knows the way out. Remember, God's greater than, bigger than stronger, and he's victorious. And God knows you. And more than, more than God knows you, God loves you. And so he will do what is best for you, what is right for you. Not what you think is best, but what he knows is best for you. Because God will always, I said this in the children's sermon, God will always be faithful because he said, I will be faithful. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one darkness is a part of our life but god is comfort he's protection and he's light and we can go to him verse 5 david says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows now did you notice did you notice that i don't know if you've you've noticed this yet or not maybe you have but did you notice where the table the table who's there too who's close by our enemies and did you also see catch what he said about the cup our cup it overflows and here's the truth god has empowered us to accomplish his will in a world that has forgotten him or you may put in that blank ignored him or you may put in that blank redefined him whatever you want to put in there you see we don't have to get caught up in the way the world thinks we talked about this last week just because we're faced with opposition when it comes to following God, that doesn't mean that we have to stop or that we have to surrender. We can go against the flow of culture because God has given us exactly what we need to walk that narrow path that leads to, to life instead of walking the easier, wider route that ultimately leads us to destruction. Second Chronicles 16.9 says that the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So God is looking, and he's looking for you. And if you've committed your life to him, then what he's doing, he's, he's going to come in, and he's going to strengthen you to do what he's called you to do, to live the life that you've surrendered to him, to live. And it doesn't matter what's happening around you. God, God is going to strengthen you. He knows. Jesus knows life is hard. Remember, he, he lived it here on earth. Jesus knows what it means to go against the flow. He's keenly aware of the cho what the choice means to if you choose to follow him. He knows what that means for you. And that's why we can be confident, even in the presence of our enemies, even in the presence of a world that doesn't get it, even in the presence of a world that doesn't like it, even if in the presence of a world that says that you're a bigot, even in the presence of a world that says you're narrow-minded, even in the presence of the world that says that's you, you're just you're just you're just doing that because you need that or because you're a crutch or you're 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 not up with it even in the presence of all of that we can follow him because he's given us more than enough my cup overflows more than enough to die to ourselves and to live for him even if it goes against what the world says is right what the world says is good or how the world says we should live the world has forgotten the god of the universe or Maybe, maybe the world, like as I said earlier, it maybe has just kind of redefined him and made him more like us. But the world says, uh, it's we've forgotten the God of the universe and says that we can be our own gods and that we're free to live as we see fit. But God says, I've prepared a table for you in the presence of all of that. And I'm going to give you more than you ever could dream of or imagine so that you can live the life that I've called you to live. And in verse 6, David says, Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. And David, he's not just pointing to eternity. Okay, He's not just saying one day, but he's pointing to right now. And here's, when, when we say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, what, what that is, it's, it's, it's a declaration of my belonging. I belong to God. John 1.12 says, Some, however, did receive him and believed him, 
so he gave them the right to become God's children. One of the biggest, I think, epidemics, and, and I've heard people say this, actually, I was at a conference uh, earlier in June where they said this, that our country, one of the biggest epidemics facing our country is loneliness. Loneliness. People wanting to belong, longing to belong. And in Christ, we, we have life, we have purpose, we have meaning, we have hope, we have a future, we have a family, and we belong. We belong to him. We, we're his. We're his. That David was saying, I, I am God's. I, I, I am his child. And, and, and David says, the goodness, and, and the, I love that he says this, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And, and I get this picture of it's like, you, you know, have you ever seen, um, you know, famous people, and they're kind of walking along, and then there's always just two people, usually big dudes that are with them and kind of serving as bodyguards. And, and, and I get that picture where David says, and, 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 and faithfulness, love, love is, and, and faithfulness are going to follow me all that. So wherever I go, these two big dudes are following me. Love right here, faithfulness right here. It doesn't matter where life goes. I will always have God's love. God's never-ending love, God's unconditional love is going to be right here by my side. And faithfulness, God's always going to be faithful and and his and and those things are following me and so in other words they're they're pursuing me they're they're going with me and i love that jesus makes that first move we love because he first loved us and because he loved us first we're invited in and we can dwell with him you know what you know what's What's, what's so sweet in this world, in, 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 the, in, in, a, in the crazy world that we live in, is, is just a friendship, a place to belong, a, a place to, 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 to just know that you're known and it's okay. You're known, you, know, you don't have to hide, you don't have to make something up, you don't have to act, you, you can just be you, and even though you're being just you, you're still loved, you're still accepted. And Christ says, I want you just like you are. You belong to me, and together we'll grow. Together, I'll give you my love. Together, I'll give you my faithfulness. And we can dwell with him one day in heaven. Yes, forever in heaven for eternity. But also, we get to dwell with him right here, right now. Because what Christ does is he comes and he takes up residence in our lives. He moves in. He moves in. And he wants to take control. That's Psalm 23. And my hope is that this will be more than just words on a page to you. And that you'll discover for the first time, or maybe rediscover, the power, the peace, the love, the direction, and the promise found in these words. And I pray, I pray for you, just like I pray for me, that we will let the Lord be our shepherd. Why? Because in him we have everything. You know what everything means? It means everything. We have everything that we need.